The main theme in group theory is to take a group and try to understand it in terms of uh, simpler parts, in particular its um, subgroups. So um, it's natural to ask the question of uh, given a group and um, given a couple of, of uh, subgroups of that group, um, how can we fit these subgroups together to make maybe a bigger subgroup of G? You know, for uh, a natural question might be, if you look at all the products of the form HK, um, then when is this itself a subgroup of G? Okay, so um, to answer that question, let's uh, use a little bit of uh, kind of standard notation. So, you know, when I juxtapose uh, two subsets of the group like this, um, I'm talking about products of things in one times things in the other. I'll use that for both um, subgroups, but just arbitrary subsets of a group as well. If I have some subset of a group, I'm going to write capital S inverse to be the set of G inverse such that G is an S. So you can do the same kind of notation with these inverses. So from this language, um, let's just say briefly, what does it mean to even be a subgroup in the first place? Well, a subgroup is something that's closed under the uh, basic group operations, multiplication and inversion. So um, if I have a subset in the group, then S actually is a subgroup um, if and only if, well, closed under multiplication. So if I look at products of two things in S, I'm back in S. And if I do inverses of things in S, those are also back in S. Now, of course, once you know that you're a subgroup, um, then, so this means you're a subgroup. But being a subgroup means that, in fact, if you look at products of things inside your subgroup, that's actually equal to your subgroup. And inverses of things in your subgroup, what well, is your subgroup So Everything is the inverse of something. So you actually get the inclusions both ways. All right, so that's going to be a uh, useful way um, to think about um, to think about the condition of being a subgroup. And now let's state the result. Um, so given H and K as above subgroups of a group, the following are equivalent. The following are equivalent. Uh, number one, um, K H sits inside of H K. Number two. Um, HK is a subgroup. And number three, HK equals KH. So when do a uh, product of two subgroups give you another group? Well, if when you write things in the wrong order, you could rewrite them in the correct order. Okay, so let's just uh, do this proof. Um, so uh, let's say one implies two. So if Kh is contained in Hk, I want to show I have a subgroup. So what does that mean? I want to show that Hk Hk lands me back inside of Hk. Well, what, let's just see what happens if I uh, write this out and reassociate. That's Hk Hk. But if I think about these two things in the middle, and I use my assumption, I can reverse the multiplication inside with a containment. This is contained inside H. H, uh, K, K. But then I can regroup again and think about it as H, H, K, K. And because H and K are subgroups, H, H is H and K, K is K. So that's H, K. And so, indeed, this product is contained in there, closed under multiplication. How about closed under inverses? Well, if I look at H, K inverse, well, looking at products of things in here and here and taking inverses. The inverses reverse the order of the multiplication and I get things of the form uh, K inverse H inverse. But then again, K and H are subgroups. So that's KH. And by hypothesis, this is contained inside HK. And so I'm closed under inversion. So therefore, one implies two. How about uh, two implies three? So for 2 implies 3, um, I want to say, suppose I have a subgroup, why is it that HK is KH? Well, if you have a subgroup, then if you do HK, HK, um, that has to give you HK again. Oh, excuse me. Of course, that's true. Excuse me. But actually, what I wanted to say is that if you have HK and you do the inverse, 
that has to be HK then. Sorry. Right. So that's true. And but now, just as before, I can rewrite this as K inverse H inverse. And K inverse is K and H inverse is H. So that's KH. And so um, if you're closed under if HK is closed under inversion, because it's a subgroup, then you have to have three HK is, is KH, and of course three implies one. Um, and so this gives us a nice criteria to think about products of subgroups uh, being groups. A uh, particularly important example of this is when um, is when uh, one is the normal it contained in the normalizer of the other. Right. So as a particularly good example of this, say a corollary. Um, if H and K are subgroups of G, and for example, K um, normalizes H, well, then HK is a subgroup. Right, because to say you're, um, to say that K normalizes just means that if you look at KH, K inverse, um, that's H for all K and K. Uh, or in other words, uh, KH is um, HK. Well, um, but that says everything in the form HK can be written rewritten in the form KH, uh, you know. So that implies HK is contained in KH or vice versa. <laughs> they're, they're actually the same. And so you have a subgroup. Let's have a little fun with the orbit stabilizer theorem. So suppose I have a group G and a couple of subgroups. Um, let's say G is a finite group. And we want to count um, the number of things uh, in the product. So these are just things in the form HK, H and H, and K and K. All right, so I'm not assuming that this thing is a group or anything like that. I'm just looking at all the elements of this form, and let's just see how many there are. I mean, of course, there might be, um, you know, some, there might be, um, you know, uh, two different expressions of this form um, that might be equal, but with different H's and K's. And so, you know, it's not obvious kind of exactly how many there are, but let's just, let's just go ahead and count. So um, to, to do this, we're going to note that the group um, H cross K acts on HK. It acts in the following way. Like, if I have a pair of H comma K, and I want to say, how does this act on some, like, little X, little Y, where X is in H and Y is in K, I'm going to define this action to be um, HX YK inverse. Okay, so you can just uh, check that this is an action uh, that amounts to noticing that if I have um, H1, uh, K1, H2, K2, and I act on X, Y, then the two different ways of working this out, either by um, first acting by the first thing and then acting on this, uh, by, the, um, by this guy, is the same as doing it this way, multiplying these things together and then acting. So you can just uh, check that this is an action. Let's just say check, but uh, you know, actually check. Um, and so um, because of that, um, you can apply the orbit stabilizer theorem. And um, let's also note, um, actually, that, um, that HK consists of a single orbit, right? Because, um, you know, if I look at how HK acts on the identity element, which is some particular thing in HK, it's identity times identity, then this is equal to, um, well, how about HK inverse acting on E? Uh, it looks like HK. And so in particular, um, everything inside of here is in the orbit of the identity. So the orbit stabilizer theorem tells us that the size of the orbit, which is the size of HK itself, is the same as the size of the group, H cross K, divided by the uh, size of the stabilizer. Stabilizer in H cross K of the identity. Okay, well, so what is the stabilizer of the identity? Well, um, the stabilizer of the identity, well, those are just the H comma K's 
um, such that when I act on E, I get E. But what is this action? It's HK inverse. Um, well, that is to say, the, uh, the uh, stabilizer can be identified with a set of pairs HK such that, um, you know, in H cross K, such that um, HK inverse is E. Well, HK inverse is E actually is just H equals K, right? Such that H equals K. Well, what are those pairs? Those, uh, the number of such pairs are just things in the intersection, right? This is the same as just the, um, I don't know, call it uh, G comma G, um, such that G is in H and G is in K. The number of such pairs is the number of things in the intersection. So altogether, what do we have? We have that the order of HK is the order of H cross K divided by the order of the intersection. Of course, the order of the product of two sets is the product of the orders. And so you get this formula uh, for the order of the product. There are, I'm sure there's a lot of easier ways to do this, but you know, using the orbit stabilizer theorem is always fun, so there's that.